The Sisters of Life are having a powerful effect in the world, and this morning we have one of them with us, and you are in for a treat. We'd like to invite to the stage our dear friend, Sister Bethany Madonna. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Father, we'll pray over Sister, and so please join us in prayer. Always ready. Oh, not in front of everyone. <laughs> in the name of the Father, Son, Son, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. May Almighty God bless you and keep you. May the Holy Spirit fill your heart. May your words not be your words, but may they be anointed words straight from the Holy Spirit directed to our hearts. May God speak through you, sister, and I bless you. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Katie. I love you all. I am going to face Our Lady. I need to look at her. I hope you don't mind. I'm sorry for that. Okay, Blessed Mother, you're with me and I'm with you. Good morning. <laughs> I thought I'd start this morning with just a little story. Two of my sisters were out for a bike ride on a lovely summer day, and I'm, they're going to remain nameless just to protect the innocent and the embarrassed. Um, one of the sisters rode ahead and it was at an incredible speed. And she hit a bump and her bike kind of flipped forward, catapulting her. Um, she took air and landed directly into a perfectly manicured, prize-winning rose bush. Um, and, and the sister behind her, I mean her first thought, obviously, was for the safety of sister. But her second thought, and it might have been concurrent, was just like, this is gonna drive this, the owner of the bush out of the church. I mean, this is the last straw. I mean, they're gonna leave. And sister like sunk deep into the bush and you know, her rosary's like entangled in the thorns. And the woman who owned the house opened the door and she starts running out yelling and the sisters brace themselves and they go, you are an angel sent by God. You're an angel sent by God. And she like pulls sister up out of the bush and they're, they're shocked. Sister's totally scratched. That rose bush to this day bears an indent of that habited body. I mean, it was destroyed. And as she carries sister in to clean her wounds, she keeps repeating this in tears over and over. It turns out she was going through a painful divorce and although she hadn't been practicing her faith, that morning she had prayed her first sincere prayer in years. God, if you can hear me and if you care, I need a sign. Just moments before sister came hurtling through the air. <laughs> God knows where you are. He can hear you. He wants you to know how much he longs to hear your voice. So let's just say a prayer this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we bless you and we praise you. We thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for loving us in this lavish way, this total way. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and the life that he brings us. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to fill us, to guide us. Ask that you would be in each and every heart. Open us to see and receive all that you desire, every good gift. Come, Holy Spirit. We entrust ourselves to you, Blessed Mother. Help us to say yes. Help our yes to be in your yes. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. I love this theme, and I was thinking about what it means to be blessed, broken, and given. And so first of all, to be blessed, the Father bestowed on us by sending us his son and giving him to us, Jesus, every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Jesus is the revelation of the Father. Jesus is the word that the Father spoke to us. Jesus shows us how much we are loved, how deeply, purely, totally, holy. The word blessing comes from the Latin Bene dicere, which means to say a good word. A good word was spoken over your life. 
the moment that you were conceived, this word is continually spoken over you again and again and again. You are upheld, sustained in being loved. In the book of Genesis, we read, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. The same God who set the bounds of the ocean, who placed the stars in their courses, who had a thought, and it became Niagara Falls. Snowflakes, pineapples, iguanas, <laughs> orangutans, the peacock. I mean, think of all of creation. It's so intricate, there's so much beauty and creativity in the sense, smells, textures, sights, colors. This God made you with more care, with more intentionality. He made you in his image and likeness. You reflect something of God, something no one else was entrusted with. I love fingerprints. They're one of my favorite things in the world. Fingerprints identify you as the only you who ever has been or ever will be for all eternity. Now out of all of the millions and billions of people who have ever existed on the face of this earth, no two have had the same set of fingerprints. Now, if God is gonna take so much time to arrange and design the invisible circle pattern on the end of your finger to be totally unique to you, how much more time did he take in the love in your heart? It's yours. No one loves like you. No one can love with that love. No one can be your substitute, your replacement. No one can stand in your place. And no one can love God as you love him. And no one can receive God's love as your heart receives it. He longs for this. He says, I made you, you belong to me, you are mine. You know when your favorite song comes on and you just need to hear that first guitar strum or like that piano intro and you're like, whoa, <laughs> it's my song. I can't believe it's playing right now. I really can't. And you have this kind of like indescribable, like knowing that when God inspired that in the heart of the artist, he actually had you in mind, you know? And you're like, you're telling a friend, you're like, hey, this is my new favorite song, you gotta hear it. And they're like, oh yeah, I really, it kind of reminds me of it. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't talk during the song, thanks. Yeah, no, okay. Maybe I shouldn't have introduced you to the song. I didn't know you couldn't handle the song. Okay, this is my song. Well, I'm gonna share my song with you and I recognize the acoustics in here are not ideal, okay? So let's just say it right away. But maybe if you could like look away for a moment. <clears throat> Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me and you have been so so good to me before i took a breath you breathed your life in me and you have been so so kind to me oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of god oh it chases me down fights till i'm found leaves the 99 i couldn't earn it and i don't deserve it still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And then if I played the guitar, this is where it really takes off, you know, and you like change your capo and everything. No, it's okay. <laughs> hey, that's your song too. Each and every one of you has a Genesis moment. You have your own salvation history personal to you. I want you to close your eyes. We're gonna invite the Holy Spirit. I wanna go back 
Let's go back to the moment of your conception. Go there with the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Take us to that moment. Regardless of the circumstances, <laughs> that moment when you were alone with God, when he willed you into being, chose you, breathed life into you. The moment God said, not another day without you. You weren't a mistake. You weren't an accident. God certainly wasn't surprised. You were always wanted. The Father delights in you. This is a place of warmth, a place of total acceptance and delight. There's so much love there, and I just want you to take a minute. Drink in the Father's love that's there. Drink it in like you're thirsty. Okay. You can always go to that moment in prayer. That is a real moment. You can live in that moment. The Father loves, wills, breathes life into you, accepts you, delights in you. At the moment of our baptism, you received God's blessing. You were consecrated, you were sealed, you were set apart as holy. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit came to dwell in your soul. This happened to you and to me at baptism. You are never alone. Be alone with the Father who sees you in secret. So we're blessed, we're broken, we're also broken. Yes, we live in a fallen world and ever since Adam and Eve in the garden, sin is a reality. Our own sin and the sins of others. Each one of us has unique sufferings, pain, Sorrows, experiences, this brokenness is part of our story. And it actually forms us. There are times when we can feel tempted to think that we're a burden. That we're all alone. As if I've been rejected. That I'm on the outside, actually. Not someone chosen and beloved, but having to earn, having to prove to be loved, needing to establish my own identity because I didn't receive one from the Father, striving to be better and it will never be enough. This is a temptation, this is called an orphan spirit. It can attach itself to us. And we have to pray for deliverance and healing from that. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He loves us. Let me tell you about Teresa. One Saturday morning, all of our sisters were in meetings with women who had found out they were pregnant and very tempted and vulnerable to abortion because of the fear and the pressure, the overwhelmment. There was one sister at the convent who was not in meetings. She was a novice, just learning the mission. She was the only one. She thought, I'll just get lunch on, I'll sort the baby donations, I'll kind of keep the house in order. Ding dong. She's like, oh no. <laughs> she goes to the door. Three seniors in high school. Hi, sister. We were just at Planned Parenthood. Now we're here. Can we come in? She was like, welcome. Open the door. We never receive referrals from Planned Parenthood. So, sister pulled out all the stops. She's like, I'll just entertain them while, until the sisters come out of their meetings. So, she gets the pink lemonade going, a whole tray of cookies. She asked them to tell, tell me your story. Like, how'd you find out about us? She said, I got pregnant. I was very scared. I didn't know who to tell. I told my friends. And they said, well, we'll support you whatever you decide, which is like the worst thing you can say to someone in that situation. They need to hear, I'm with you. Let's get help. I'm strong. You're strong, and I'm going to be with you, guiding you, finding someone to help guide us. But that's not what they said. They drove her to the abortion clinic. 
And as she was waiting for her abortion appointment, she started getting sick to her stomach. She knew this was wrong and she didn't know what to do. So she went to distract herself at the magazine rack. And popping out of the magazine rack was a brochure. She was like, oh, what's that? She pulls it out, it says, make a choice you can live with. What if this pregnancy doesn't mean your life is over? It's a sister of life brochure tucked in a magazine at Planned Parenthood abortion clinic. How it got there, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> you know, I can't do anything incognito, so I'm not like going in like, hey, how's it going, guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. No. Ain't. She read it. She burst into tears, and she came to our convent. So sisters is like talking to them, waiting for the sisters to come out of their meetings. Two hours pass with these curious women. And they have covered every topic under the sun, dating, sex, contraception. And finally, sister's like sweating it out. And this young woman stands up, she goes, sister, I am gonna rock this pregnancy out. And sister's like, what does that mean? She's like, she goes, I'm doing this. This baby is a blessing and my life needs to change. She graduated from high school, she had her baby and she was able to go to college. There she met a wonderful young man who fell in love with her, asked to marry her, and asked if he could adopt her daughter as his own. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus came to her with his love. He gave her his grace, and he led her to choose what was good for herself and for her little one. He knows exactly where we are, and he meets us there. There was a priest living in San Francisco who shared this story with us. He had received a panicked phone call that there was a girl at the top of the Golden Gate Bridge. Could he come and assist? Now, this priest was a very short man, and he was terrified of heights, absolutely. So he drives up to the scene, and they point her out to him. Nothing would get her down. So although he was petrified, Father stretched out his hands and begins climbing. And as he climbs, he's like shaking like a leaf, you know? And the man is drenched in sweat, like that kind of total downpour kind of a situation. And it was a windy day that day, so like the, the bridge is kind of swaying. He's like praying the perfect act of contrition. He's like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm sorry. And this girl, sees someone climbing up towards her, and she leans over, and she's shocked. She goes, hey, you're almost there. You're gonna make it. He's inching, literally inching, and as he climbs into view, she sees the Roman collar, and she pulls Father onto the little platform that she's on, and, and Father needs a minute. He's just kind of rocking himself, and she is so moved, her heart is so moved. He doesn't even know me, and he thinks I'm worth it. And finally, Father can speak again, and he looks her in the eye, and he says, how am I gonna get down? And she goes, I'll help you, Father. No, okay, she kind of turns him around, then she sees the situation, she goes, I'll go first. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. She gets down, she goes first, she's like, okay, foot here, okay, down, care, oh, easy does it, yeah, one at a time, left, right, one, two, she brings him all the way down. They get to the ground, everyone's hugging, safe and sound, and everyone goes, Father, what did you say to her? And he's like, she saved my life. <laughs> Yeah. Jesus comes to the place where you are. Jesus comes to the place where you are and he says, hey, you're not an orphan. You have a father who loves you. And he sent me. I give you my mother as your own. You have a family and a home in the church. You are accepted. When we receive the reckless love of God into the places of our hearts that seem broken, he heals them. 
He glorifies them. He lets light radiate from those very places that seem so dark. God sees each human person, no matter how weak, how poor, how sick, how rejected, as his beloved, one for whom he gave up his life. This is mercy. This is mercy. We long for mercy. We need mercy. One day we received a phone call from a woman in crisis, pregnant, pressured, overwhelmed. But in her heart, she deeply wanted to choose life and wanted something to work. I'll call her Annie. So Annie was extraordinary. She grew up on the streets of Brooklyn in an Irish-Italian neighborhood. She'd been baptized, she made her first Holy Communion, but that was really it as far as like the practice of the faith or catechesis. She admitted that she wasn't the most outstanding pillar in the community and that she'd given the NYPD a run for their money. Um, but Annie would come over for tea once a week and we soon realized that she had a very deep longing for God. One day, Annie asked sister, so sister, how old are you? Sister kind of evades the question, doesn't want to answer it, and she starts talking about G.K. Chesterton, how he used to say how old he was according to the last time he went to confession and was made new, born again in the sacraments. So he was either eight minutes old or two weeks old or three days old, depending on the last time he had gone to confession. And Annie kind of laughs, but... She was also, you know, fascinated by this concept. Then she goes, nice job changing the subject, sister. I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. How old are you? I was like, yikes, don't mess with Annie. So a few days later, that sister gave her a call and set up the next tea date. And she's just about to hang up, and Annie goes, oh, sister, by the way, um, I'm six hours old. Sister goes, oh, I'm sorry, pardon me. It was, it was hard to hear you just there. I said, no, I went to confession this morning. I'm six hours old. It was her first time going to confession since she was a child, preparing for Holy Communion. Over 10 years. And the priest who heard her confession walked her through it step by step. And as she said, and he wasn't shocked by any of my stories. And sister was like, how did you feel when you walked out? And she said, like I had the weight of the world lifted off my shoulders, I feel brand new. In an instant, 10 years of sin and shame were lifted and she knew it in the depths of her soul. And when they hung up, sister rang the bell that's reserved only for prayer and all the sisters came down and they jumped up and down like all the saints and angels in heaven rejoicing over this one who'd come home. And that next week when she came for her tea break, we threw her her big one week birthday party, cake, candles, presents, the happy birthday song. It marked a new beginning and a restoration of her innocence. We see this too in our hope and healing mission for those suffering after abortion. Jesus' mercy has power. He makes all things new. We haven't always made choices that are good or beautiful and on our own, we don't have the strength to, but we always can trust Jesus with our weakness. Confession relieves us of burdens we were never meant to carry. Know this, that your love is a treasure and your heart is meant to be a gift to another. We're blessed, we're broken, and we're given. I remember learning this myself as a freshman in high school. I didn't want to miss out on anything that made life fun and exciting, that would make me popular. My older brother was on the football team and I had access to a lot of parties through him. I witnessed a lot of regret darkness, and it didn't take long for me to make a decision that that's not gonna be my scene. That commitment lasted me through my junior year of high school when one night I was getting ready uh, to go out with my friends. Night on the town, the mall, the movies, ice cream, uh, back for more movies, stay up all night talking, but then a call came in. Parents are out of town, somebody got a keg, bring whatever you have. Are you coming? And they're like, yeah, we're on the way. I don't know where your conscience is, but mine's in the pit of my stomach. And I was like, Ree. I was like, no, oh, wow. What's happening? I'm sorry. You know, I'd rather go home, actually. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel that well. I think I want to go home. Talk about a tense car ride. 20 minutes of my life in silence. You could cut the tension with a butter knife. 
And I always claim the grace of this night on my confirmation. On the day of my confirmation, I was just very concerned that another girl was wearing the same dress as me. I was like, what? Oh, come on. Why does this stuff happen to me? But now I'm not concerned when someone else is wearing the same thing as me. But <laughs> this night, I claim on the grace of my confirmation. As I got out of that car to go back into my house, I said something that took fortitude, which is a strength that's beyond you. Only the Holy Spirit could give it to you. I said, do I need to find a new group of friends? And as soon as I said it, I was like, no. They looked up at me. They looked straight ahead. I was like, all right, wow, okay. So I closed the door, I walked towards my house. My life for a movie scene, this is like where the black billowing clouds like come out of nowhere. You know, suddenly you're drenched. You don't know why. You walk in. My parents were like, whoa, you're home early. I was like, yeah, whatever. I go into my room. Found my saddest CD. Put the saddest song on my sad CD. Play, repeat. Laid on my bed. Lights out. And I just let the death of my social life just sweep over me like the ocean so I could drown in it. Oh, Got out my black eyeliner, I'm like drawing teardrops, you know, <laughs> I did not do that. Oh my gosh, I did not do that. Very lonely, lonely time. And then one day in one of my classes, a girl reached out to me and she said, what are you doing Sunday night? She invited me to her youth group, just like my friends, like, like to have fun, clean cut, but this group went to Bible study and they did retreats. And I'll never forget going with them to my first retreat. There I was, 17 years old in Eucharistic adoration. And my youth ministers were like, ask Jesus how he made your heart to love. I had never thought to do that. And I said, Jesus, everyone else here seems to know you in a way that I don't know you. I want to know you. I want to know you. How did you make my heart to love? And it was in that moment that I felt like the Lord was inviting me. Consider being totally mine. I always I assumed I'd be married to a wonderful man, have my own litany of saints for kids. Peter, James, John, Paul, Thomas, Philip, Bartholomew, Linus. And Jesus wasn't asking me to give up my desires, but he wanted to fulfill them in a way only that he can. He was asking me, will you love me with this love that you're saving for a husband? And will you let me love you perfectly? And will you love every child as if it were your own child of flesh and blood? Brothers and sisters, you have been blessed. You are holy. God is calling you to love, a deep love. To live purely, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they see God. You don't want to entrust your heart to just anyone, but someone who understands the gift that he or she is receiving, who treats you with reverence and respect. Our bodies are sacred and good. We don't want to settle for counterfeits. We don't want to use others. We don't want to let ourselves be used. I was listening to a woman's testimony online about how as a teenager she had stumbled upon pornography, didn't know what it was, soon found herself addicted. It led to habitual masturbation. The shame was overwhelming, like a choking. She describes delicately and tenderly how Jesus grabbed her and pulled her out of that and set her free. We can always reach out for help, give voice to those things that the evil one wants to remain in darkness. Jesus wants to set us free. You deserve the truth. You deserve the truth that what is portrayed in movies and shows as romance, those lifestyles leave so many hearts devastated by the lies. If God is calling you to marriage on your wedding day, you will look at your spouse, ladies, you in your white dress, gentlemen, dapper in your suits, and you'll say, I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, for richer or poorer until death. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. 
And on that night, the night of a couple's honeymoon, when they come together for the first time as husband and wife, they become one and their bodies make flesh the wedding vows that they set at the altar. Sex is not a commitment in itself. Sex is the expression of the commitment of wedding vows. I give myself to you freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully. To have sex with someone without having made those vows is like telling a lie with my body. This is not free. I might not be free. Faithful, no commitment here. Total, I don't know where I'll be in a year, or you. Fruitful, no fruit. No, this is not what God intended. He intended freedom and joy. Your love is good and it's worth fighting for. Your love can change the world. So rise above the paltry standard that has been set for you. Rise above it. Young men, some of you in this room are called to be husbands and fathers, to love your wife with all that you are and have, to love your children, to be present to them. If that is your vocation, say yes with all that you are and have. Some of you young men in this room are called to be priests or religious brothers, to bring Jesus down from heaven, to give him in word and sacrament. If this is your vocation, say yes with all that you are and have. Ladies, some of you are called to be wives and mothers in this room. If that is your vocation, say yes with all that you are and all that you have. To help your husband be a saint, to bring forth children for the kingdom. Ladies, some of you are called to be religious sisters, consecrated. Say to Jesus, I am yours and you are all mine. To love every child as your own. You're here for a reason. The saints never blamed or accused God for the evil they saw around them. They knew he had called them to live at this time in history. God chose you for now. God chose you for now. Give him permission. Say yes. We're like the bread that Jesus offers to the Father, blesses, breaks, and gives. Your love is a gift. trust ourselves to you, Father. Help us to receive ourselves as a gift. Help us to trust you. Guide us by your Holy Spirit to know how we're called to give our lives in love.